Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. I know a lot of people with not only on the saving side of things, but thinking about like I, like I did, you know, looking and seeing if abroad you can earn more as well as save more. But I met you know people in finance, people you know working、um, in commodities. Lots of industries who have these nice expat contracts with housing covered and international school for their kids covered, and I think that is a way to really fast track、um, your savings and also have a, an, an adventure in the meantime. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. What happens if the rug is pulled out from under you? I mean, this can happen financially, physically, spiritually. Your life can change in an instant. And how can you supercharge your financial independence with geo arbitrage? Bali's not only about bintang t-shirts and partying. Joining me at the mic today is Amy Minkley. Hello, Amy. Hi, Phil. So great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, no worries. Thank you very much for coming on. And I'm just disappointed you're not in Bali today. You're in the、um, <laughs> U.S. of A. <laughs> I am. I'm usually in Bali、uh, nine or ten months of the year, but happen to be with、yeah. my my folks now. Okay, so Amy is an international speaker, financial independence event producer, and devotee of financial independence. We'll talk about.、Um, I just wanted to talk talk about the Fabex video. That、um, you shared with me, and、um, we'll put a link to this in the blog post as well. But just tell us the story about what happened to you when you were twelve years old. Yes,、um, when I was twelve, my life changed overnight.、Um, so I, you know, had a very happy childhood. My parents. We're happily married. I thought I never see the, saw them fighting, so I felt really happy and safe and secure. And then when I was twelve, my dad sat me down on the you know living room couch and told me he was leaving. My parents were getting a divorce, and it was a shock to me. Later, I found out he had a younger girlfriend, and you know he was going through a midlife crisis. And the financial situation of our, our home changed overnight. Uh, my dad had money, but you know he said he couldn't fully pay child support. So my mom and I really struggled. You know, we had to sell our family home. We moved to a different state.、Uh, my mom went back to college, and suddenly I felt like the poor kid at school. I really struggled with confidence and worthiness issues. It had some harmful effects, but there were also some really good effects as well. Like I really learned how to save, and you know, my in high school I had two jobs. I was figuring out, you know. Earning four dollars twenty five USD an hour, you know, but working those two jobs, calculating on my calculator in secret, you know, working at the budget theater. Once the movie started, how many hours did I need to work to buy my first car? Which you know, you kind of need in the U.S., especially where I grew up, to get to work and those kind of things.、Um, and then you know, in college, I paid. You know, I had two jobs, went to a state school. Lived in budget apartments, just really always was trying to figure out. Worked as a residential assistant and RA in the dorms, trying to figure out how could I afford, you know, to pay my college and my rent、um, without getting into a lot of debt, which a lot of American students get into. And I imagine managed to get out debt free, and it took me five years. So you know, those basically with my father leaving, I, I had this sense that I needed to be responsible for my own finances. And that money could disappear at any moment, so I needed to be really money savvy and save as much as I could. It's really interesting, though, that you reacted that way. A lot of people、mm. might、uh, react in different ways, but your emotional reaction was a financial one,、mm. and that happened at a very early age for you. Yes, I mean, my、yeah. mother at the time, you know, I was really her support system, and、mm-hmm. she would share with me, you know, she was going through heartache and、um, shock, and also、uh, her biggest concern was really about money, and so she shared a lot of this money concerns with me, and then I saw her reading a lot of financial books because she had depended on my dad to take care of that, and she didn't really know much, and she was trying to educate herself, and she gave me a book in high school, I think it was called "Girls Just Want to Have." Funds, <laughs> so it was、mm-hmm. a play on the Cindy Lauper song, but with the D funds, and so I read that, and, you know, and I started investing, you know, as soon as I got my first job out of college in、um, retirement accounts. Did you take it to extremes? I've heard a lot of people, you, you know, you wanted to get through paying your debt very quickly,、mm-hmm. and I've heard a lot of people going to extremes, like living on the the cheapest, poorest quality food as well. <laughs> were, were you a fire extremist like that? <laughs> I would say, yeah, I didn't eat 
cheap, poor quality food, but I definitely took it to extremes. You know, there was mm. a lot of things that I denied, you know, you know, certain events that are, or, you know, things that would have been memorable. Like, for example, I did go to London. I remember I didn't want to go up in the Tower of London because, oh, well, maybe it was 11 quid at the time. It wasn't even, I don't remember how much it was, but it seemed like that was a lot of the time. And so, you know, there's, there's um, memorable things that I missed out on because I didn't want to spend the money to do them. And so I do regret being kind of cheap sometimes. I did do a lot of international travel in my 20 years abroad. Um, but mostly I was a budget traveler. <laughs> so I stayed in some not so nice places. <laughs> Met the local cockroaches around the yes, world. Huh? <laughs> I probably did. Yeah. Yeah. So why do you why do you sc- describe your savings habits at the time as fear based savings? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean I I was always focused on on saving and even when I had built up my savings. I still didn't feel safe. My savings rates ramped up through the various jobs. I, I worked in Asia for 20 years. You mm. know, so initially in Japan, you know, 20 years ago, I was only saving 5000 a year. And then I went to Singapore and I was saving 37000 This is USD a year. Indiana was saving almost 60000 a year. And I still did not feel safe. And I was investing all of this, you know. And then um, I did take a gap year and I was blissfully happy and I met my Australian partner during that that gap year. And, you know, I probably had a, a decent sized neck nest egg that I didn't have to go back to work right away. But fear drove me back to to working in a job that I really wasn't happy, but I still had that need because that that that, that job, I, had, I saved about 90,000 USD a year. Um, And I was really unhappy and my relationship was suffering. My health was suffering, but I was focused on that savings rate. So definitely it was a fear-based, yeah, habit. And how did you end up with a better relationship with money? Is that what what Mm -hmm. you're talking about when you say you had a, you turned your life around to have a better relationship with money that it didn't, was it about the jobs that you were doing and your Mm -hmm. own happiness? Yes. um, I think when I went to Bangkok and I had, you know, I'd had my kind of best life and sabbatical time in Bali and met my partner there and really saw a new realm of possibility and so many um, opportunities there, you know, because before I had loved, I was an international school teacher and I had loved that, but I didn't have much balance. And then when I went to Bali, I saw a lot of entrepreneurs and really inspirational, motivated people doing really cool things, but having a little bit more agency over their time and their choices, that motivated me to kind of see a different realm of possibility, but still I, it takes a while to, you know, get something off the ground. And so I went back to that job and, and I was unhappy there, but it really, it really was discovering the fire movement, the financial independence, retire early movement. And having a better understanding of how much money do I really need? And, you know, I know how much it costs me to live in Bali. And I have a pretty decent sized nest egg that I had invested and saved over the 20 years abroad, you know, that's going to continue to compound and grow. So if I, if I can find a way to earn enough to pay my living expenses in Bali, you know, I don't have to keep contributing, you know, this $90,000 worth a year savings and work till I'm 65, I can have a little bit more freedom to try entrepreneurship, to try life in Bali and pursue something different, like a next chapter in my life. Well, let's uh, talk further about geo arbitrage. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the bigger picture with geo arbitrage? How does it work and how did it work for you? Well, I I would say, you know, when we break apart the word geo arbitrage, for, for listeners who may not know, you know, it's choosing geographically places that will support your ability to save. A lot of people, you know, will be digital nomads and they will earn in Aussie dollars or US dollars and they will live somewhere cheaper. Um, I also, I would say, use geo arbitrage on the earning side of things because as a teacher in the US, you don't earn much. Um, but I lived in some expensive countries like Singapore. Um, people wouldn't necessarily consider it a geo arbitrage destination because the cost of living is high, but my pay was also high. And I was able to live pretty affordably there because my, my schools would pay for the rent. And then I would, and what they, you know, they call it house hacking. I would rent out the extra bedroom, (laughs) even though I had free rent and I did that in India too. So, yeah. So it's finding ways to grow the gap, you know, between what you're earning and what you can, you know, and then what you're spending and then investing the gap in the middle. 
And I think, you know, choosing destinations that are more cost effective, and it doesn't have to be international, it can just be moving from Sydney to Brisbane's cheaper, right? Or, or mm, another, mm. An, you know, a lower cost of city, lower cost of living Any, area. Anywhere out of Sydney. <laughs> exactly. Anywhere out of Sydney. So, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people have done that in the US too. And I'm sure in Australia with COVID, people are working from more remote locations for, for the cost of living. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? The opportunities that mm-hmm. um, the COVID epidemic uh, brought out for people and the idea that you can be a digital nomad, that you can have a job or you can be a mm-hmm. contractor or you can do something, but you can basically do it from anywhere mm-hmm. in the world. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I love too. I mean, I lived in I lived in New Delhi, India, which it was a great environment, you know, a great school, but you know, the pollution was horrible and that's I ter- just, terrible pollution yes, over there, isn't it? It's one of the most polluted pollution. cities in the world, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I love India, but you know, I I don't know, those international schools, I worked really hard and so now I'm teaching online a lot less hours per week and I can set my schedule. And so it's nice that I can live in Bali. So is that what you do? You teach online, is it? You still teach online? A little bit, not a Mm. lot. I mean, I feel like I do have a nest egg that I don't have to contribute a lot to it. But, you know, if I can really teach one hour a day, I've covered my cost. Um, Mm. So my, you know, I'm spending myself about 50, 55 USD a day. My partner spends a similar amount. We share accommodation and we live really well. I mean, we eat out twice a day. I go to yoga. I go to all the classes I want. I mean, we're not living the cheapest Bali existence for sure. We have a luxurious life, but we're also not living the most expensive place we could live, but we have a nice place. And so, you know, if I can teach one hour a day, that can cover my cost in Bali. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and of it course, is. clothing is very cheap. I mean, Bintang t-shirts are very t- right. cheap. Aren't they? <laughs> That's what I wear every day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we'll get on to talking about the events that you produce, but mm-hmm. um, you're obviously speaking with many other people in this area of financial independence and especially geo-arbitrage. Do you have any other stories of people and how they've approached this? Yeah, I would say, you know, I know a lot of people with it, not only on the saving side of things, but thinking about like, I, like I did, you know, looking and seeing if abroad you can earn more as well as save more, both, you know, mm. then you're really growing the gap. And so, you know, a lot of people I met in Singapore, for example, you know, they're not, I met a lot of teachers and I worked at a, in an Aussie owned school, actually. So I, met, I worked with a lot of Kiwis and Australians that were also doing the same coming abroad to, to teach abroad. But I met, you know, people in finance, people, you know, working um, in commodities, lots of industries who had these nice expat contracts with housing covered and international school for their kids covered. And, you know, so that I think that is a, a way to really fast track um, your savings and also have a, an, a, an adventure in the meantime. You've geo-arbitraged in Mexico, Thailand, and Bali. Do you have a Mm -hmm. favorite, and what are the kind of differences? Yes, I really love all three of those countries. And we found that we spent about $50 USD each per day, you know, sharing accommodation, my Australian partner and I. But we found the quality of life in Bali and Thailand is higher than Mexico. So what that $50 bought us was um, nicer accommodation, nicer restaurants, um, more access, you know, um, renting, you know, more access to better transportation and going to classes. And yeah, we prefer and we also feel a little safer in Asia. I mean, Mexico is perfectly safe. A lot of places in Mexico are. It kind of depends on where you are in the, the country. Um, but we, we do like Mexico. But we, we feel like in, in comparing Bali and Thailand, we feel like Bali also gets us a better quality of life a bit than Thailand. But we love both and we'll spend part of every year in Thailand as well. A lot of people from like us who live in really privileged first mm-hmm. world countries worry about going to places like this and especially things like healthcare. Mm-hmm. How, does, how do you deal with that? I have a plan with Cigna and it's a plan out of Thailand, Cigna Thailand, but I feel confident, you know, with a large company like Cigna International Company, you know, it's about 125 USD per month. Is is this um, insurance, is it? It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is insurance. It will cover me. It doesn't cover me for um, small visits. It, you know, has a higher deductible. Um, But Mm. really what my concern is, is, you know, a motorcycle accident, you know, cancer or something major like that. So it will Mm. cover me for 
um, anything catastrophic. And then, you know, as far as, um, you know, smaller visits, doctor's office, my annual visits every year, I do that. I go to Thailand <laughs> and do that. Mm -hmm. I feel like in yep. Thailand, I get better medical care than I do in Bali. They've got great medical care in Thailand, yes, haven't they? they yeah. Amazing. And amazing, Singapore yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I do, and I dental, do. All, and dental as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do my dental. I do, I do have the smaller things in Bali, but, um, I like to go to Thailand every January because it's rainy season in Bali. <laughs> so I go there and just do my annual visits. Yeah. And um, yeah, ultimately, I feel like my partner and I will, when we're older, we will settle in Australia. So, you know, we will have some coverage there. Mm -hmm. So who is JL Collins and what is the simple path of investing in US index funds and what influence did it have on you? Um, that book, yeah, was was a great book. I mean, J.L. Collins has been in the finance industry for multiple decades. He really tried to stock pick and beat the stock market. And he found that really just doing broad base, low cost index funds was a lot easier. And, you know, often the psychology of the stock market, you know, I know personally, a, a lot of people and myself included is like greed and fear can get me like when when the stock market's rising, then the greed kicks in and I want to buy. And then when it's falling, you know, fear kicks in and I want to sell. And so, you know, even though, you know, I know better and a lot of people know better in intuitively, we, we are ruled by those emotions. And so he found that really, you know, a set it and forget it kind of um, index fund works well by, you know, he says, buy the total stock market index fund, buy it often, and just leave it for decades and don't worry about the ups and downs of the market. And for me, that's worked really well. I don't want to read quarterly reports and, you know, try to keep up with stock picking. I know my partner's done, you know, some stock picking in the past, and he's interested in that to a certain degree, but I feel like you can get, you know, th there's also something nice about the diversity of, you know, my total stock market index fund has 3,500 companies and there's, there's nice, it's nice to have that diversity. Mm. So yeah, I love that book. Yeah. At what age did that influence you? And is that what you started investing in when you were saving all this money? No, I, I found that book uh, once I found the fire movement in 2019, mm -hmm. when I was left Bali, I went back to Bangkok to work and I wasn't very happy there. And I found the fire movement and that book was probably the most, one of the most popular books within the fire movement. Also, when I was a, you know, younger, I was reading about low cost index funds. And so I was investing in, you know, funds that are designed based on a target retirement date. Mm, mm. And um, I did a lot of that, which I don't like that quite as much because I like to be able to, to sell whatever's high. You know, if, if stocks are down, then I'll sell my bonds or, um, so I, I, you know, that kind of lumps it all together and you have to sell just, you know, the shares and that index that is designed for a target retirement date. It's, it's the easiest option, but now I, I do, you know, a total bond market and then I do a total stock market and that way I can kind of sell what I choose, what I want to sell. Yeah. So it simplifies mm -hmm. your investing as well, I guess, mm -hmm. doesn't it? You don't have to think about it. You can just, um, just keep adding to it as you, as you can or drawing down as you, as you need. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So now that you're engaged to an Aussie, mm -hmm. so you're engaged, you're not, yes. you, you said you've, you've been together for a long time though, have you? And finally decided to do it officially? Yes. Five years. Mm -hmm. And both wow. of us have <laughs> never been married. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm 46 and he's, you know, in his early fifties. So this is a, yeah, it's quite yeah. a big decision. And yeah. so you've been learning about the Australian share market, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Because of obviously he's influencing you about this. <laughs> yes, a bit. I mean, I'm still learning, but he, he sold his property. He bought a property and had it in Brisbane for 25 years and got tired of managing it internationally. So he sold it recently. So he came into a bit of money that we've been looking at um, how to invest it. So we are, we're also, you know, he has individual stocks in Australia um, and he's pretty heavily invested in Australian stocks. So we are mm -hmm. going to do some index funds just to balance out the portfolio and, you know, probably just do the Vanguard Australian share index, VAS, and um, some of the, the VTS, you know, some a little bit of the U.S. total stock uh, market shares index and maybe some of the global market index. But, you know, again, it's still even those global market index, it's pretty heavily U.S. based. Um, mm -hmm. So we might do a little bit of emerging markets and emerging markets index or something like that. But yeah. you know, we're trying to figure out at this point, like, how do we reinvest that money? And we want it to be more passive and not have to worry about it too much or not look at it too often. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? The number of different styles of index funds mm -hmm. that you can get, like you can get a total um, US S&P 500 index, mm -hmm. and then you can get another one, which is everything in the world 
apart from the US. So Mm -hmm. it's so easy to diversify across different regions, isn't it, nowadays? Yes, yes. And I, what I like about, you know, the index funds is, you know, I know in the past, at least, like I will get analysis paralysis trying to figure out what's, you know, and I'll keep my, and I've done this before, where I've kept my money Mm. out in a bank account, you know, and not earning anything. And I feel like mostly, you know, I'm losing money by not investing and just trying to, you know, overanalyzing it. So I feel Mm. like it's good to just put it in and trust that over decades, it's going to go up. Okay, well, let's talk about the Balinese fire freedom retreats that you run. Mm-hmm. How, how many have you done so far? This is my first one. Oh, this is the first one. I'm okay. super excited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I heard, you know, I was teaching during the pandemic in Thailand and I was listening, going down this fire rabbit hole, listening to all the podcasts and reading all the books and, you know, learning kind of the principles of it. And I heard about all the events in the U.S. And I thought there mm. needs to be a, something on this side of the world where I've lived for the last two decades. And, you know, I know there's, you know, a couple, I think there was a Fin Fest in Australia and Sydney last year in November, you know, a couple single day events, but not really anything multi-day, which I really feel like something special happens on the mm. second or the third day when people gather together in a community. You know, I feel like you can, I can learn a lot on podcasts and books, but you know, when I, my dad, unfortunately had a stroke. And when I left Bangkok, I went, I came back to the U.S. for nine months and was, you know, helping out my dad. And I went to six fire events, multi-day, like, you know, four, Mm. three days to four day events during that time. And it was, it was magical. I mean, the community is really special. And so I had the idea in Bangkok, but really when I attended those six multi-day events, I really saw the power of community and um, I'm, I'm so impressed with the people. They're some of the, the smartest, most creative, most generous, supportive community I've ever met. They got Resor- on my resourceful, resourceful, resourceful. they got on my well. spreadsheets. They logged mm-hmm. into my Vanguard account. They looked at my asset allocations, people just giving their time for free. You know, one mm-hmm. woman as a, a nurse practitioner, a healthcare expert, you know, met me on zoom for free just to talk about healthcare. People are so generous and I was inspired by that. And so I really, I really believe in the power of community and, you know, the speakers are great, um, but mm. the, all the conversations I had with the other participants, it's a really money savvy group. You know, people who had worked on Wall Street, people who are very knowledgeable. You know, I learned just as much from the other participants as I did from the speakers. So I was excited to come back to Bali and create an event there. And um, what what do you talk about at these events? I mean, you're talking about investing, but um, mm-hmm. obviously people are going to be talking about their own financial independence journeys and um, some of the tools that they use. Well, give us some examples. Yeah. I mean, people talk about real estate. They talk about, you know, index investing. You, we don't have like, it's not big onto crypto. You know, people will talk about crypto, but it's a small percentage of people's portfolio, maybe one or 2%. It's not like a crypto crowd at all. It's mostly mm, people mm. thinking about diversifying their portfolio and investing in things that are quite safe and have shown um, a lot of potential, you know, over a lot of history. Um, A lot of people talking about living their best life and Mm. really not only their money, but how do they value their time and their energy and what really brings them happiness and how can we spend more time with family and giving back and contribution and community So it's not a, it's not a place where you get people trying to sell to you from the stage or you get, um, people trying to pawn some kind of product on you at all. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really people coming together and supporting each other on their own fire journey and inspiring and motivating each other. Presumably it'd be difficult to sell anyone to a financial independence person anyway, because they're so careful (laughs) with their money. (laughs) Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, most people are, you know, doing the low cost index funds, you Mm. know, with low management fees. So, Mm. you know, it's, it's kind of the boring type of investment, but, you know, and, and, and also people are talking about, you know, it's not only, you know, investing, but saving and how to earn more. So a lot of people are talking about entrepreneurship, side hustles, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of people in Bali as well in the hospitality industry, aren't there, mm-hmm. that are running restaurants and clubs mm-hmm. and so exactly. forth. Exactly. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. A lot of yeah business owners. And and to be clear, I, I don't know if you're asking about my retreat, but most of the people coming to my retreat are not currently living in Bali. And the I was going to I was going to ask mm-hmm. about that. That yeah, the, the people that are coming are coming internationally, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The retreat sold out really fast. And a lot of people are coming from the U.S. I have sold tickets to some Australians and some Singaporeans, but it's mostly people from developed 
countries that are coming. Um, so I'm excited to kind of unite the Australian fire community with the U.S. fire community. And um, yeah, that's going to be fun. But a lot of people want to come to Bali and, and especially people, there's quite a few people who are already retired and they're retired early and they're very money savvy. And so they've got the time and the money. And so they're going to come over for a month and, and uh, do things <laughs> yep. before and after the event as well. So um, who are the speakers at the event? I've interviewed 24 speakers and all but three of them want to come. So I mm-hmm. haven't confirmed them all yet because la- the last two weekends, I went to two fire events in the US. I went to Economy, which is an event with about 400 people. It's kind of a TEDx kind of style stage with hundreds of people in the audience specifically related to the fire movement. But yeah, I've got Joe Salcii coming from the Stacking Benjamin show. He's written the book Stacked as well. And he mm-hmm. is a he produces multiple podcasts in the US. Such a nice guy, really heart-centered community member. And then I've got Lisa Peterson, who wrote Millionaire Mindset. Mm -hmm. And um, she's got a podcast, two podcasts as well. Also a great speaker. She worked with high net worth clients, you know, financial advisor for 25 years and realized even with these high net worth clients, they, a lot of them still didn't feel safe with money. And so she deals, she knows a lot of the nuts and bolts of finance, but she also deals with mindset and our relationship to money. And a lot of the participants, that's primarily what they're interested in. I mean, they've built a pretty big nest egg, most of them. So they were also interested in talking about life optimization, relationship to money, those kind of topics as well. So you're looking at opening up more places for people to come in and especially to encourage people from Australia to come. So um, what can you tell listeners who might be interested in coming to Bali for this? I will say that there is so many benefits um, to coming to an event like this. And I personally felt that when I went to these events. And that's why I attended six (laughs) in nine months, (laughs) Mm. Uh, because it is an investment. I feel, you know, I've walked away from each event with a tip that has ended up saving me one, one event in California, I got a job where, you know, I'm teaching online now kids with ADHD, you know, another event, I got an idea about tax loss harvesting and tax gain harvesting, which ended up saving me money long term on my taxes. Um, I felt inspired on my journey by the people I've met. I've gotten financial and, you know, not advice. It's not official advice, right? Tips from people who know more about money than I do. And so I feel it's an investment, not only hearing the speakers, but connecting to the community, building lifelong friendships. For me, it's yeah, I love these kind of events. And that's why I'm so excited to create one in my own home. And then we're going to be having adventures together in Bali. We're going to, you know, go do fun things around the country. People, a lot of people are sticking around afterwards. There's really an opportunity to build friendships and unite the fire community internationally. So how can listeners find out more? They can go to FiFreedomRetreats.com. How do you you spell that? Yeah. So FI stands for financial independence. So F-I, freedom, and then retreats with an S, dot com. And again, it is sold out, but I have held a few places um, for Australians because I've got a... The American spots sold out really quick and I wanted to have some more, (laughs) some more spots for Australians. And if your listeners would like to go to my contact page, they can sell up, sign up for the mailing list and then they can be the first to know when those spots open up. I will prioritize Australians. I do have a lot of Americans on the wait list, but I will prioritize it. I feel like, you know, it will be a much more diverse and rich conversation to have a really truly international audience there. And, um, you know, we'll be having an event in 2024 as well. So I'm I'm very excited about that too. And, and this is in Ubud, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's where I live. So it's, you know, I'm so excited to, to showcase my home. And I came to, you know, I know a lot of your listeners have been to Bali already. And I, I've been to Bali dozens of times, having lived in Singapore for many years. Um, but there's something special about living there. And something I never saw as a tourist. So I'm, I'm happy to show listeners and participants, you know, um, another side of Bali that they may not have seen. Amy Minkley, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for having me. And thank you for, you know, expanding financial literacy to your audience and what you're creating in the world. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. 